that for drones. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So let me read briefly about his biography. Dr. Ali Horiza is a University of California cooperative exchanging academic stationed at the Kearney Agriculture Research and Extension Center. His current research efforts are on sensor development, robotics control and automation, precision agriculture, and advanced spray applications. So we just talk about spray. Um, Ali completed his graduate studies at the University of Florida and obtained his PhD in agriculture and biological engineering in 2014. And he developed several high throughput plant phenotyping systems for yield monitoring, forecasting, for food grading and sorting, and early plant disease and pest detection. Ali won the 2016 International uh, Guisip Pelizi Prize, his first place, by the club of uh, Bologna, 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 which is a worldwide prize awarded every two years for the top PhD dissertation in agriculture and mechanization. Okay, his doctoral dissertation focused on interdisciplinary research in citrus diseases detection, and he developed several real-time vision-based sensors for laboratory and field experiments that detected citrus diseases such as Guanglong bean, HLB. That's all right. So uh, please join me to welcome uh, uh, Prof uh, Dr. Um, Paul Reza. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So today, uh, what happened? OK, so today I'm going to talk about precision agriculture. OK, so it's working now. And um, we all know that we are dealing with a lot of problems right now in the world, like problems like um, labor shortage, and global warming, climate change, and increasing temperature that affects the food production. And um, so basically, in order to have a good response for the food shortages in future, we need to optimize our crop production and food production uh, so that we can meet that uh, huge need in future. And one of the methods to do that is precision agriculture. OK, so uh, I think you talked about precision agriculture a little bit today, but uh, can you give me an, a definition of precision agriculture? Do you know what precision agriculture is? Any idea? Yes, please. Uh, so it, it basically, it's where you use, um, you use uh, machines to, to precisely put uh, seed, seedlings in certain areas in a, you know, in a, on a farm or a field, right? That's part of it? Yeah, that's exactly the beginning of that. Uh, but it's a little bit wider, so let's take a look at an example first, and then uh, I will give you a formal definition. This is an aerial photograph of a citrus grove uh, in Florida. This is like an old photograph, so I know that these days we can create awesome aerial photography, but this is an old one. Uh, do you see any variability here? Variability. What do you see here? So these are probably the citrus trees, right? So do you see any variability? Yes? The uh, level of red in the picture is different in that patch and then patches up on the middle right. Exactly, and that represents tree sizes, right? Yeah. So here we can see less dense tree size, also this area. But comparing to this area, which the trees are very dense, right? OK. So uh, we went to the, I mean, the grower went to the field and harvested. And uh, they left these uh, dots on the map. So each dot represents a citrus bean that was harvested in the field, right? 
and uh, they just um, log the location of each beans and they um, present it in this graph on uh, at the layer on this uh, map. So this map actually these dots shows the density of uh, yield at different location in the field. But let's take a look at a continuous uh, version of that dotted map. So this map is in an interpolation of those dots. And you can see in this area and in this area, we had much less yield comparing to the other part of uh, the field, right? But if you remember, we had less dense trees here and less dense trees in this area. So that makes sense, right? We had a map that showed us availability, and then we had our yield map that also shows, highlights that availability for us. So we can say these two are interrelated. Our task as precision agriculture specialists is to get rid of all this variability in the field. We want a uniform field with uniform yield and um, so we can have uh, the maximum output from the field, right? So we want to get rid of this and this and we want every part of the field to be green. To do that, we need to find out what caused that variability and then try to uh, respond to that, respond that in the next year, next growing season. With that, we can improve the yield, right? And also, we know that these areas are good, these areas are good, but these areas probably need more nitrogen or any kind of nutrition. So, we should apply more nitrogen in those areas, but not in this area, right? That actually gives us the ability to apply variable rate ap um, fertilizer, uh, variable rate application of fertilizer. So basically, we want to apply just as much as needed, not more, not less. So with this, I can give you a definition of precision agriculture which is managing each crop production input, including fertilizer, herbicide, insecticide, seeds, as you said, uh, on a site-specific manner, uh, which means we don't apply a uniform rate to the entire field. We apply as much as needed at different locations. Basically to achieve three different uh, objectives, to reduce waste, to increase profit, and more importantly, to protect the quality of the environment. So what are the tools for precision agriculture? The most important tools is, any idea? Sensors. Sensors, yeah, and what kind of sensor? Ground level, satellite, drones. Exactly, but you need to know where you are in the field, right? That's, so, so the first thing you need is a GPS. And then if you have a GPS, you can do sensing and you can correlate those sense data to GPS location. So GPS is definitely one of the necessity. Then you need a geographic information uh, system or GIS software to process all these georeference data. Uh, you need crop scouting or ground truthing to validate the in the data that you captured with the drone. And um, you need a yield map. Yield map is the base of precision agriculture. So it's the starting point and the end point. Yield map shows you the variability in the field. Then you try to get rid of that variability. And then you create another yield map the next year. That second yield map works as a feedback in your system. So you want to know how good you uh, try to get rid of that variability. Remote sensing is an important part because sensing uh, is actually half of the precision agriculture and the other half is the application or variable rate uh, application. So we need a sensor and we need actuator to uh, apply what we interpret from the data. And uh, 
that sensing can include soil testing, crop production testing, um, water, moisture uh, measurement in the field, and any kind of measurement, disease and uh, pest distribution map, any kind of map uh, we can create by sensing and then layer that in a GIS system and then try to interpret that and make recommendation based on that. That recommendation is for pesticide, for fertilizer, for um, cultivation, for any operation that you do in the field. Okay, so this is a relationship between uh, integrated pest management and precision agriculture. We can probably skip this. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna, so right now you have an overall view of precision agriculture. I'm gonna give you some examples of um, sensing project that uh, I have been involved when I was in Florida and how we can use this sense data to create a prescription map or to apply precision agriculture. So uh, another map that would help us a lot is a prediction of yield in the field. So if we know right now or like in March or uh, even in winter, how much yield we would expect in the summer or in uh, fall, we can uh, manage and we can uh, adjust our field operation so that we can get rid of those areas with low yield. Or we can do some improvement in the season so that in the, at the end of the yield, at the end of the season, we have a more uniform yield. So, uh, I did my PhD in Florida, and as you know, Florida is all about either citrus or gator. So uh, my project always uh, involved citrus. So uh, here is one project um, that was done, that was led by th Dr. Donna Choi. Uh, she is a professor right now at Penn State. Uh, and she used 3D imaging to count the number of green citrus fruit uh, uh, on the tree and then create a um, yield forecasting map. So we used Kinect. You know Kinect is a, a, a module for Xbox and uh, it has a couple of sensors. It has an IR, a depth sensor, and an RGB camera, so we uh, took um, depth images of the trees. And uh, okay, so here are the color images that taken from the tree. Can you see the citrus fruit here? You can probably see them, right? But it's very hard to use color image uh, to differentiate citrus fruit from background. Uh, this is a, an image that was taken at night and this is an image that was taken in the daytime and you can see the illumination difference in the image. That's, that's a big problem for a machine vision system. So to get rid of that, uh, we, we did uh, IR imaging and also um, and depth imaging. So this is IR photos, and we can see there are much less variation uh, in the illumination. And here is the depth images. So in depth images, we, do, we are not dealing with light, right? We are just dealing with distances. And the distance is the same in the day and at night. So by using depth images, we actually solve the illumination problem. And uh, you can see that two images uh, are very similar. But how we can use depth image to um, detect citrus fruit? Any idea? Okay, so what we are gonna do, we're gonna differentiate citrus fruit from leaves, right? Citrus fruit are like this, right? It's a spherical, and leaves are surface. So, how can you detect the spherical surface? Definitely with depth imaging. So what we did, uh, we combined near infrared and depth images and create new 
um, uh, new uh, image. So this is uh, an NIR image before enhancement, and we did some enhancement to make it more uniform in intensity. And then here is the process to detect the roundness of citrus tree. So uh, if, we, if we have a round object in our frame, that would be like this, right? A convex surface. And that can be uh, sensed in the um, depth images, which is different with leaves. Okay, so uh, we, created, we created a three-dimensional new uh, three-channel image. Uh, so uh, U-plot and V-plot. So U-plot and V-plot are actually the um, frames extracted from depth images uh, in uh, vertical, and, uh, vertical and horizontal direction, and then the NRL image. And then by combination, we created these three-channel images. So this is uh, the NIR. The NIR images were thresholded by intensity for the, um, segmenting the citrus fruit area. And this is after threshold. We can see a lot of leaf area also uh, selected. And this is a threshold in the depth uh, images in X and Y direction. And we apply the watershed to uh, find the, uh, to actually candidate uh, the objects in the frame. And then we did the classification to see if each of these candidates is citrus tree or not, is citrus fruit or not. So, so we used uh, different, three different methods, deep learning, uh, traditional neural network, and VGGF. And uh, here is the classification based on VGGF. And here are the results. So you can see 82% uh, correct classification. Uh, about 70% uh, of the fruit were missed or misclassified or was not, were not identified. So. Uh, I think it's a very good result uh, because there is no other alternative other than machine vision or uh, any other technology that can detect the green immature citrus fruit from the background. Another method that uh, was used for the same purpose uh, was thermography. That was done by Hao Gan. He's still a PhD student at the Precision Agricultural Lab at the University of Florida. So uh, instead of um, depth imaging, this time we used a FLIR thermal camera. And uh, so first we went to the field and we took the thermal image of a canopy at different time of the day, and from morning to the afternoon. So in the morning, we found out very interesting thing. In the morning, citrus fruits are cooler than the rest of the canopy. And as we get closer to the launch, uh, they try to get a uh, very similar temperature. And then when uh, we are going to the afternoon and towards the evening, the citrus fruits actually become warmer and the rest of the canopy uh, become cooler. So here is uh, this graph shows the temperature changes over time. So the blue line is the ambient, ambient temperature, red is fruit, and the, the dotted green is the leaf. So here you can see before noon, uh, the leaf is warmer, and afternoon, the fruit is warmer. So we can actually use this um, temperature-based characteristic of citrus fruit and leaf to detect immature citrus fruit, right? So uh, natural temperature differences between fruit and leaf surface uh, exist, and we found out uh, how they change. Um, 
and these are uh, the, the result that I showed. So the temperature changes over time and the temperature is different for the fruit and leaf. Okay, so right now I'm gonna show you a video, a very interesting video uh, that explains more of what I just said. So in this video we take a thermal video of a canopy, we spray the canopy and we observe how fast uh, the fruit and the leaf get cool. Okay, so everything looks similar, it's sprayed, and now we can see that um, the leaf gets cool, very cool, very fast, but the fruit doesn't get cool that fast, right? Yeah, very interesting, right? So if you just spray, you can clearly uh, differentiate fruit and leaf. Okay, so this is um, the image processing steps. Uh, subtracting before and after images to creating the thermal difference and removing background. So this is um, one step of background removal and uh, segmentation based on temperature values. And here we use the half transform, half uh, cycle detection algorithm to detect the round area in the frame. And here is the result. So again, about 85, 86% accuracy, which is very good. Uh, it's even better than depth imaging. And I think with combination of both, we can achieve even more uh, accuracy. Another sensing that would be very important for precision agriculture is uh, disease monitoring. and. Uh, this is part of my own PhD dissertation. Uh, so there is a disease for citrus, it's called citrus greening or HLB, which is like a cancer for citrus. There is no treatment for this uh, disease. And uh, if a tree gets infected, it will die eventually. And uh, so it's very important that we detect the disease before it gets very serious and we eradicate the tree to keep the rest of the orchard uh, healthy and happy. So this is the citrus production in Florida in 2004, about 13 million. And uh, this is in 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. We can see a decreasing trend in the production. And here is uh, in 2000. 15, just 5 million tons, 13 million tons, 5 million tons. So this disease almost destroyed the citrus industry in Florida completely because the situation right now in 2017 is m much worse. So um, you know another state that produces a lot of fresh citrus in California and uh, so it's not that infected now. Just a few trees were found in Southern California, but we need to protect the rest of orchards before it gets that serious like Florida. So to do that, uh, basically HLB creates some symptoms, but it has a very long latent period. Symptoms may not show up in months or even years. So uh, the disease will remain in an uh, undetectable, non-symptomatic stage for a long time, but in, during that time, it uh, is a source of bacteria for Asian psilocyllid, which is an insect that carries the bacteria from infected tree to healthy tree. So we need to detect the citrus, uh, infected citrus trees before they show any symptom. <clears throat> I'm sorry. This shows how fast citrus screening uh, distributed throughout the entire state of Florida. I mean, in the citrus producing counties, which are in the southern Florida, just in five, six years. That can happen to California too. 
So, uh, citrus greening creates some um, symptom on the leaf, but these symptoms are very similar to some nutrient deficiency. This is a citrus greening symptom, which is a light green area in an asymmetric pattern on the leaf. And we can see that's very similar to uh, zinc deficiency or magnesium deficiency. And this is a healthy tree. So we should, be a, we should create a sensor that can detect HLB and can differentiate HLB from nutrient deficiency. One of the reasons that the uh, disease uh, spread very fast throughout the state of Florida was that the grower mistook uh, HLB with nutrient deficiency, so they just applied more uh, zinc, but that didn't help because that was not zinc deficiency. Okay, let me tell you what that is. So this is actually a starch. So what the disease does, it blocks the main vein in the leaf. So the starch that is produced in the leaf in the morning can't go to uh, the vein and um, to the rest of the tree. So it, started to, it starts to accumulate in the leaf. And after a few months, it creates these kind of symptoms. But a starch has a very uh, interesting optical property to rotate the polarization plane of light. In other words, if you uh, illuminate a starch, let's say, with polarized light in this direction, it will uh, reflect the light in perpendicular direction. So if we create a sensor that can detect this polarization rotation uh, in the light, we can detect the disease. So this is the first prototype that I've developed. It has um, two cameras and a set of LEDs. And I had polarizing filter here. So um, we can zoom in. But in this area, we can see one part of the polarizing filter was cut and replaced with another polarizing filter in a perpendicular direction. And that part is actually in front of the second camera. So we have this camera and this camera. This camera has the same polarizing filter with the LEDs. So it receives the maximum reflection. But the second camera has a perpendicular um, filter. It's like um, you put two polarizing filters in a perpendicular direction on top of each other, and you can't see anything, theoretically. Here uh, is the same concept. So basically, the second camera shouldn't see anything. If it sees anything, that's definitely the accumulation of a starch. And this is the second prototype. Uh, it has the same concept, and uh, just one camera and uh, polarizing filters and LEDs. So uh, we figured out that this uh, rotation in polarization direction happens more around 600 nanometers. So we used narrowband LEDs at 600 nanometers. OK. OK. So. Uh, Let me show you this again. So this is, uh, this is these two leaves. One of them is infected, another one is not infected, right? I'm going to stop the video. So right now, we don't know which one infected and which one is not. But let's say we are illuminating these leaves with polarized light, and then we put a polarizing filter in front of our eyes, and then see what happens. So right now, you see they are very similar. But as soon as you put the polarizing filter, the starch area is highlighted in the leaf. So you can see that. So, so we can detect the HLB disease before the appearance of uh, symptoms, because we can detect the starch, even though it's not visible. And uh, so as I said, disease detection, um, pest distribution, these are all sensing methods that we use in precision agriculture to create different maps, different layers of maps. And then uh, based on that, create. For example, with, uh, by having a disease distribution map, we can apply pesticide in a variable rate application. In other words, we can apply pesticide only in those areas that the disease exists. 
and we don't need the tree to uh, spray the trees that are healthy, right? By spraying those trees, we just waste the spray, and we just contaminate the environment and the soil and water and uh, making everything worse. Okay, so now uh, we have a class assignment, and uh, I'm going to ask you to create your very first prescription map. So um, prescription map, as I said, is a map that shows you um, what to do in the field, what uh, variable rates you have in the field, and then where those uh, variable rates are. So in uh, this assignment, uh, we want to create a prescription map for herbicide application, right? So this data can be uh, collected in any way with a drone or with a ground sensing or even with some um, inspector. So we, in this case, we send uh, a crew of inspectors to the field to just um, look for weeds. And then whenever they see weeds, they put a dot on the map. So they created this dotted map, right? Then uh, we know the application rate based on the number of um, weeds in each grade. Grid. So we want to know uh, how much pesticide, herbicide, we need to apply in each grid. So to do that, we have a variable rate applicator that can apply five different rates. Zero or just uh, not applying, 10, 20, 30, and 40 gallon per acre. And then um, each grid is one acre. The herbicide cost is $30 per gallon. And uh, here are the steps that you need to take to create this map. So first, you need to um, count the number of, do you, do you have one of those uh, oh, assignments? You stored them. OK, OK. So uh, you have one um, table with dots and another empty table. I want you to first count the number of dots in each grid and put the corresponding number in the corresponding grids uh, in the other table. Yes? Is there like a specific criteria or an effective amount of like herbicide that you will need to apply to each little dot? Like, like say 10 gallons is good for three and like for five dots, 30 gallons is good, is there effective or you just have to kind of eyeball it and figure it out? So first you need to see the distribution and the variability of weeds at different locations. So when you do that, you can see the variability is between zero weed in each grid mm -hmm. up to 20. Uh -huh. So 20 would be the maximum okay. and zero would be the minimum. Yeah. And then you have five different rates. So you can uh, create threshold uh -huh. between uh, different values. For example, um, zero would be zero, right? Uh -huh. One to five would be the first. Five to 10 would be the second. 11 to um, 15 would be the third. And 16 to 20 would be the last one. Uh -huh. So in 16 to 20, you need to apply the maximum rate, right? Yeah. OK. Yeah, kind of linear. <laughs> so then uh, I want you to calculate the amount of saving for herbicide, another word, how much herbicide you saved, but not applying or not over -applic applying, and uh, how much saving you can make in dollar by uh, using a variable rate application and precision uh, agriculture method. If you have any question, please let me know. So if we want to apply a uniform rate, we apply at 40 gallon per acre the entire field. So that would be uh, 
non-precision agriculture method. So you can calculate the amount of herbicide and dollar in that condition, and also the amount of herbicide and uh, dollar you pay for precision agriculture method, and then deduct it to, to uh, find out the amount of saving. Then uh, you can use these patterns. So there are five patterns that uh, you can use to indicate the rate in that in each grid. So anyone who has the answer can raise hand. Okay, can you give me the answer? Uh, so for the calculated amount of saving, uh, I ended up getting 400 gallon saves. 400 gallon? Uh -huh. Okay. For the amount of savings in dollars, uh, it's $12,000 savings. Okay. That's what I got. So, so $12,000 is a lot of money, right? Yeah. That's uh, enough motivation. Okay, let's see if this result are, is correct or not, right? Okay, so uh, this is the map of uh, wheat distribution, and this is the prescription map that I created. So you can compare your map with this. It should be similar. Your map should be similar because your answer is very close to correct. So let's take a look at the result. About 390 gallon per, uh, is the total saving in herbicide, and 11,700 uh, is the saving in, do in dollar. Do you have close uh, result or similar number? You don't? Any question? I'm just still trying to figure out what my thoughts are. Let me see. Because like I did it from 0 to 0, 1 to 5 is 10, 6 to 10 is 20, 9 to 15 is 30, and 16 to 20 is 40. Mm -hmm. So I'm just seeing where I might have made a math mistake. Okay, so I think we don't have much time, uh, just 15 minutes, so we move on. And uh, if you have any question about this and you want to follow up on this task, please give me an email and uh, we will take a look at it. So um, another thing that I'm going to talk about is 
actually the application. So let's say we collected all this data, we do the grant through thing and interpretation and finally we create prescription map. So now it's time to apply precisely and to do that we need control system. So um, variable rate is the application of material uh, such that the rate of application is based on the precise location. Like what you did, uh, the rate at each grade is different or uh, qualities of the area that the material is being applied to. Okay, so there are two different variable rate application method, map-based and sensor-based. Map-based is just what I explained, right? So you go to the field or you fly a drone or you have a handheld sensor, you go to the field and collect data, site-specific, and then you create a map like this that shows the variability in the field, whatever the variability is, right? Another method is the sensor-based. So in the, this method, you don't need actually a map. You have a sensor and you have a very fast computer on the applicator that can collect the data, interpret that, and then um, create the application rate and then adjust the application rate on the go. So let's uh, take a look at each of these. So let's say this is a map that we created um, and then we want to see how the application rate, uh, the variable rate application works. So let's say this is a fertilizer and as soon as it passes each boundary and goes into another boundary or grid, the application rate changes. You can see the live application rate here. Cool, right? I think it's even more cool if we do that and uh, we protect the environment because we need that. This is a sensor based also. Uh, we have a sensor uh, here and then uh, we have a controller and processor and it uh, interpret the data and uh, decide about the, the rate and then command the uh, uh, variable rate applicator to switch to the new rate. Well, in this method, we do not need a pos positioning system because we are measuring on the go. Uh, we do need a prescription map, but this sensor-based VRA needs a very fast computer because uh, it needs to do many processing on the go. And this is a closer look at this machine. Okay, so this is a comparison of uh, variable rate machine and variable rate human. This uh, video was created by Dr. Asani, who will be here uh, as a new professor. And this is uh, about uh, avoiding waterways. So waterways are some area in the field that you don't want to spray. So the sprayer should stop when it uh, arrives at the waterways. So we can see here, this is the waterways. It automatically stops the sprayer and right after it passes the waterways, it restarted. The driver doesn't know what's going on behind him. Probably listening to Spotify and just driving and this is happening uh, completely autonomous. So what, what happens when you spray in the waterway? Well, uh, you don't want to spray that because that contaminates the water. Oh, okay. That's an uh, air side. Yeah. And this is also an alternative. So if you don't have a machine... <laughs> That's convincing. Some <laughs> water, right? Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, a few control systems. And uh, uh, since we talked about spraying, I'm gonna show you di three different control systems uh, for sprayers that can be used to convert a traditional sprayer into a variable rate sprayer. So one of the methods is the modulated spraying nozzle. 
Um, so in this method, the controller actually controls the timing and duration of discharge from each nozzle. And by changing the time and um, the duration of this chart, you can uh, create different rates. Uh, we need high speed valves, and uh, we need to, uh, we can uh, change the flow rate and also the, the droplet size uh, on the go. And um, so each nozzle works at the full pressure, so uh, anything that applies will have a uniform uh, pressure. So the key here is to vary the amount of time that each valve is open. Um, the advantage of this method is that we can control the droplet size, and if we can control the droplet size, we can actually control drift uh, by pressure. And the uh, disadvantage is that uh, because it's on and off, we probably will have some missed area. This is a closer look. So you have uh, a set of sensors and actuators here, and then um, nozzles. Another method is the flow-based control system. So uh, this is the simplest method, actually. In this method, we need a flow meter, a ground speed sensor, a valve that we can control, and also a controller. So basically what we are controlling, we are changing here, is the flow. Uh, so there is an electric valve here and flow sensor that uh, gives feedback and they adjust the valve. And then here are the nozzles. So uh, this uh, servo valve is open and closed until the flow rate is uh, adjusted and then uh, the advantage of this system is that um, the variable rate for different boom section can be uh, controlled. And then the disadvantage is um, that the variable pressure rates can result in larger change in spray droplet size. That would increase drift. And, uh, but this problem can be solved by adjusting the speed of the vehicle. So if we drive slower, we can overcome this problem. This is a closer look. So uh, there is a rudder here that uh, measures the travel speed of the vehicle. The last control system that I'm going to talk about today is the chemical direct inject system. So in this system, you have a constant flow of water. And what you are changing is the um, flow of the spray or pesticide or herbicide or whatever the chemical uh, you're going to use. So by changing that, you are changing the concentration of chemical in the water. So the water, the amount of water that is delivered to the plant is the same. You are just changing the concentration of the chemical in the water. So uh, it's good because you can uh, eliminate the leftover tank mix because you just uh, you, uh, you, you mix the spray on the go. And uh, if you have mixed a lot, you don't need to throw them away or you don't need to keep them because you have the chemical in a separate tank. And uh, another advantage is the constant flow that uh, gives you a fixed droplet, an optimum desirable size for droplet, and also uh, the uniform distribution. But uh, one of the disadvantage of this is a long delay between the chemical inject and, and the discharge in the nozzle. So it takes a little bit of time. So if you use this for, with a sensor base, you would have a problem. But if you have a map base, because you know what's going to happen in like uh, one minute, so you already know, so you can make the adjustment and everything faster and overcome this problem. 
Say that again? Well mixed. Well mixed. How do we make sure the solution actually is well mixed? Um, I think uh, there is a mechanism here that makes sure that uh, I don't know exactly how the solution uh, is made, but I think there is a mechanism here that makes sure the amount of chemical in the, whatever the amount is, w is uniform. So you won't have like a high concentrated and low concentrated uh, area in the liquid. Okay, so this is a closer look. And it has a GPS antenna, so it definitely works better with map-based variable data application. Okay, so with this slide, I conclude my presentation today. Uh, 55 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Again, my name is Ali Pureza. I am uh, an advisor based uh, in Kearney uh, Station, about one hour south of one hour and a half south of here, Parlier. And this is my email. So shoot me an email if you have any question, comment, criticism, anything. I would welcome everything. Thank you. Do you have any questions? So I know that Dr. Aporiza is uh, on the way to UC Davis today, right? Right. So having a meeting on the pest management. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of meetings tomorrow oh, and problem. Friday. <laughs> I see you will be there for a night. Huh? Right. Oh, great. So next time, whenever you are going to drive through us, you should consider to make a stop and give a talk. Sure, it would be my pleasure. <laughs> that's excellent, excellent. The timing is just we are lucky, that's why I said it. So, uh, uh, very nice talk. Uh, it's being recorded. We are going to um, put on our past website. And, uh, so, thank you again. So, maybe is this is a PowerPoint? Yeah, uh, I can share you, the, share the link. Yeah. Okay, link. Link and then, yeah. It's not a regular PBT, I think. No, it's uh, Perzi. Perzi. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's I, online. I, I,